All right, here we go. It's showtime. Welcome back to uh, Theological Excellence. I know you uh, all have been experiencing probably profound depression over having gone over two weeks without a uh, theology lecture. So I am here to the rescue on YouTube today, bringing you what you've long sought for, uh, the beginning of our lectures on the Ten Commandments. So, just a couple things to kick off. Uh, since this first one, one, this will be Alexio Brevis, kind of like a test run here today. Uh, not to say this isn't a serious lecture, it will be, but um, we'll make it kind of brief, just see how this goes. Um, first off, welcome to my setup. I'm down in the basement so that uh, I'm away from all the kids uh, uninterrupted. Um, my materials, well, you see here, I do have a chalkboard which is a design for someone half my height and about a fifth of my age. Um, but we're gonna make do. I've got a little stool here so that I can write on the chalkboard. And um, yeah, so this will be fun. We'll see how it goes. Um, here's the deal. Uh, I'll try and post uh, a lecture every day by noon. And that gives you about 24, 36 hours to watch it. Okay, so the lecture I post uh, before noon today, Monday, is actually for Tuesday. Okay, so you can either watch it Monday afternoon, Monday night, or during the day on Tuesday. I'll post Wednesday's lecture by noon on Wednesday. And then, obviously, you aren't present for me to answer your questions, to see you raise your hand, etc. So, um, if you have questions, uh, regarding the material in the lecture, uh, you can post those in the comments box below, and uh, I'll, I'll respond to those questions, okay? So um, feel free to do that. Um, I would say that if you're going to ask questions about the lecture, so this is Tuesday's lecture, please do so uh, by Tuesday night or Wednesday. As these lectures build up and we get weeks and weeks of lectures, I guess we're going to be doing this at least through the whole month of April. I can't go back and check comments for you know weeks at a time every day, so let's limit uh, the question and answer period on each video until say like uh, the end of the day that the lecture is posted for. Okay, so by uh, tomorrow night, please have any questions or comments posted that you have on this video. All right, so let's begin. We are on the Ten Commandments. First off, briefly, let me discuss with you the structure of the Ten Commandments. All right, <clears throat> so. If you're, uh, you're reading theological material, which no, no doubt you have been, during all this free time you have in the event of the coronavirus, uh, you will sometimes see the Ten Commandments referred to as the three and seven. Okay? It's a very traditional way of referring to the Ten Commandments. This is how St. Augustine refers to them sometimes. It talks about the three and the seven. And this is a division of the Ten Commandments, which is uh, it's very logical. The first three commandments regard our relation with God, and the next seven involve our relationship with others. Okay? And so you notice that Jesus kind of sums up this structure when uh, the scribe asks him, what's the greatest of all the commandments, Lord? And Jesus says, to love God with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, your whole, whole strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. He says that encompasses all of the commandments. And in as much as the Ten Commandments are divided into the three and the seven, the commandments about God and the commandments about others, that is correct. All right, so that's the structure of the over, or overview of the Ten Commandments. Now, um, you have read last week on the First and Second Commandment, 
I posted for Monday, we read the third commandment. So uh, I'll lecture on these three commandments this week. By the way, my intention is to have a quiz on Friday. So plan on one. In other words, be taking notes on this material just like you would if you were in class and then study Thursday night. I haven't actually made the quiz up yet. What I think I'm going to do, I believe I can create a quiz in Google Forms and post it on Google Classroom for you to take and it will send me your score automatically. So um, that's what the plan is for this week. So let's get started with the first commandment. First commandment. Um, I pr advise you probably, if you have a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, that you may want to have that out during these lectures. This is what I'm going to be lecturing from, um, and uh, so it might be helpful for you to have it out. I'll, I'll note paragraph numbers as I go through here. Of course, if you don't have uh, a copy and you want to refer to what I'm reading, the nice thing about a video is you can pause it, you can pull up your catechism online, you can look at what I'm reading. Um, so, uh, anyway, here we go. First commandment. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of ever, anything that is in the heavens above or the earth beneath or that is in the waters underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. It is written, you shall love the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Okay, so essentially the first commandment is about the Lord being the only God and not having any other gods before him, okay? So now, the way I, what I want to talk about with regard to the uh, first commandment here is we're going to talk about the virtue of religion. I think we've discussed this previously. We don't normally think of religion as a virtue. We think of like a religion as like an organization. You know, like you're Christian, you're Muslim, you're Jewish. But actually, religion is a virtue. And it's the virtue, and by the way, it's a... Remember, the cardinal virtues. We said the cardinal virtues are the four virtues on which all other virtues hinge. So what cardinal virtue... Um, does religion hinge on? The virtue of religion is a subset of the virtue of justice. Okay, so what kind of justice are we talking about here when we're talking about the virtue of religion? We are talking about giving God his due. All right, giving to God what is owed to him is what the first commandment is all about. Okay, now you'll also recall as we studied the virtues that the virtue is the golden mean, right? The middle. Then you can have deficiencies in that virtue or you can have excesses of that virtue, right? So when we talked about the virtue of fortitude, for example, courage. We said that the deficiency would be cowardice, right? Being fearful. Whereas you can also have an excess of courage, which would be like rash behavior, okay? Um, foolish behavior. So in this respect, the catechism is going to break down the vices, okay, of religion. The deficiency in religion is going to be what the Catechism calls irreligion, which is either uh, a lack of religion, not giving God his due, 
or some sort of injustice against God, okay? Um, and the excess, and you might think, well, how can you be excessively religious, okay? What would the excess of religion be? And this is actually... superstition, okay, where we're not just recognizing God's power, but we're actually attributing God's power to all sorts of different things that don't have God's power. That would be an excess of religion, that we see there being like power in anything. Like, for example, um, you know, uh, somebody says something like, uh, oh, well, I haven't gotten the coronavirus, and they say, oh, knock on wood, right? As though knocking on wood is going to prevent you from getting the coronavirus. Does this wooden table that my iPad is sitting on right now have any power over the coronavirus? No. Okay, that's ridiculous. Only God has that power. So, um, now, I know sometimes people, uh, that's an expression they might use. They don't necessarily think the wood has any power. But if you attributed true power to that, then that would be the excess of religion, superstition, okay? All right, we'll get into more detail on that in just a gif. So, now here's the deal. Since uh, I'm working on a child's chalkboard here, uh, you can see my board is going to fill up rather quickly. So, uh, at this point, I'm going to have to erase. And, of course, the good thing is if you haven't gotten these notes down yet or you've been writing while I've been talking and... Uh, you can pause the video at this point, okay? Write down what you need to in your notes. Rewind if you missed anything. But I'm going to erase, and we're going to go into a little more detail here. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's start with the vices before we deal with the virtues. Maybe we'll just do the vices today. And then tomorrow we'll talk about the virtue of religion. Okay, so let's start off with the vice of irreligion. So this is the deficiency in the virtue of religion, meaning either I'm not giving God his due or I'm doing some sort of injustice towards God. <clears throat> now the catechism mentions three injustices to God. Three things you can do that are an injustice, meaning they're failing to give God his due. And uh, these will be found in paragraphs 21, 18, 19, 20, and 21. Okay? So... 21, 18 through 21 of these injustices to God. Uh, first one, tempting God. Okay, now this is an injustice towards God because in a sense it's, it's doubting God or putting God to the test. Uh, best example of this in scripture is Jesus's temptations in the desert. And one of them is the devil takes Jesus up to the top of the temple and tells him to jump off the parapet. And the ain't, by the way, the parapet is, uh, um, it's like the small fence that goes around the top of a building. Uh, so if you, like, you're up on like a skyscraper or something, and you're on the roof, okay, there's always going to be, uh, you know, a short wall or a fence around the top of the roof, kind of for safety's sake, okay, that's a parapet. So he's going to tell him, you know, climb up basically on the, the wall around the roof of the temple or the fence and throw yourself down and God will save you, okay. That's tempting God and putting God to the test. I'm making God step in and do something, okay, that he shouldn't have to do. 
Uh, best example I could give you of this, uh, and we've probably all done this at some point in time before. Um, let's say, uh, I don't know, maybe some of you are taking an AP test online or something. I think they've said they're going to do that because of this virus thing. And you tell God, uh, Lord, if you really exist, help me get a four on my AP test. All right? Kind of putting an ultimatum on God. Like, God, if you exist, then I have to get a four on this test. You're making God prove his existence, okay? He doesn't need to do that, all right? You're putting him to the test, all right? So anytime where you're trying to put some sort of condition on God, you're telling God, um, do this to prove your power to me or your existence or your love, okay, God doesn't have to prove those things to us. Those are examples of tempting God. That's an injustice to God. That's not giving God what he deserves. Okay? Sorry. I was getting a signal on my iPad here. All right. Uh, number two. Sacrilege. All right. Um, sacrilege. I hope you're familiar with this term. We've talked about it in class a little bit. This is basically um, doing uh, violence or damage to holy things. All right, Catechism says profaning or treating unworthily sacraments, liturgical actions, as well as persons. That'd be like clerics, bishops, the Pope, things. Um, places such as a church okay sacrilege is a grave sin remember uh what does the word grave mean grave from latin gravis uh means serious so anytime the catechism describes something as a grave sin that means it's serious matter which means if you have full knowledge and uh fully consent to this act it constitutes a mortal sin, all right? So, um, spraying graffiti on a church, uh, knocking over a religious statue, or the most common one it would be um, receiving the Eucharist in a state of mortal sin. This is when we've talked about it. All right, this is why I said it's so important to get to confession if you're in a state of mortal sin before you present yourself to receive the Eucharist because that is sacrilege of the Eucharist and it is a mortal sin if you know that it's sacrilege and you do it anyway, okay? That's an injustice to God. And then finally, this one's fun, Simony, okay, which would be, is the the buying or selling of consecrated things, things which are holy, okay. Um, catechism says that defined as the buying or selling of spiritual things okay so you are not allowed for example to uh, sell things like relics okay say your grandmother gave you a relic and you went and put it on like a eBay or something okay trying to see what the highest price you get for it that'd be the sin of simony okay um, I always have students who say well um, like, aren't Catholic bookstores committing simony because they're selling, like, rosaries and crucifixes and other things like that? All right, well, the thing is, is when you buy a rosary, a crucifix, a sacred image, those sort of things, uh, even, you know, vessels for uh, celebrating the sacraments, okay, like chalice, patent, etc., um, those things are not consecrated at the time you purchase them. Okay, you would after you purchase, say, a rosary or a sacred image or a crucifix, you'd have a priest bless them 
after you buy it. At that time, it becomes a consecrated thing, okay? So you should not be selling uh, things that, are, that have been blessed, that are now holy, that are spiritual things, okay? But nothing that's being sold in a Catholic bookstore is a holy or consecrated thing. So basically, the idea here is we're not profiting off of um, uh, holy things. Because once they're consecrated, consecrated means set apart, set aside. They're, they're set aside for God, okay? So um, somebody often says, well, what do I do with like uh, a broken rosary, okay? Uh, burn it or bury it, okay? That's the way you treat um, consecrated things. All right, so these are injustices against God that the Catechism lists. Now, There are two other serious cases of irreligion, and that is um, atheism and agnosticism. So with the first three that we talked about, we're dealing with somebody who, uh, let's say, is uh, generally a believer but um, does some sort of injustice against God by disrespecting something holy or sacred or selling it or tempting God. These are, are more concrete examples of irreligion in as much as these dispute the existence of God altogether. Okay? So it's not just uh, an injustice against God, it's a complete denial of God. And that's in fact what atheism is. The A is the alpha negative in Greek, so it means not or no. And you recognize theism, that root obviously the same root as in theology. Theology is the study of God. So A, theism, is the statement that there is no God. They deny God's existence. Agnosticism, similar type word, also Greek roots. So once again, you see the alpha negative there at the beginning, it means no. And Gnosticism, okay, uh, the Greek word uh, uh, gnosis means knowledge. Or to know. So an agnostic says, I don't know if God exists, all right? Sorry, it's a small chalkboard. So an agnostic says, I just, I don't know if God does exist. I don't know if he doesn't exist. I'm just not sure, okay? And uh, that may seem like a rather enlightened position. The Catechism talks about agnosticism really just being a form of uh, indifferentism. That generally it's just an excuse for somebody who doesn't care, who's indifferent to God's existence. In other words, if you're truly an agnostic, you don't know whether God exists or not, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to try and figure out if he does, right? So you're going to do some reading, some research. You want to read some atheist arguments, okay? And then some theist arguments, maybe some Christian arguments, some Catholic arguments, Thomas Aquinas' five proofs. And you weigh those against one another and you come to a decision. In other words, if you don't know something, the responsible thing to do is to come to know it, all right? Figure it out. Make a decision. Get off the fence, okay? So, um... A lot of people think they're kind of enlightened, like, oh, I don't know if God exists, all right? I'm not sure one way or the other. All right, well, that's a pretty big thing um, not to know about, right? I mean, if there's something important you want to know, it's about whether there's a supreme being or not, because that could uh, impact your eternal destiny, right? So an agnostic, if, if you run into somebody like this, you should be asking them, well, what are you doing to come to know whether God exists or not? 
right? This is a question you should be pursuing. It's the ultimate question. All right, how are we doing on time? We're at 25 minutes. All right, this is day one, Flexio Brevis. Let's, uh, let's just chill here for now. Tomorrow we'll cover superstition. Lots of good stuff under the category of superstition, the excess of religion. But for right now, things you want to know for the quiz on Friday, obviously the definition of religion, the division of the commandments into the three and the seven, um, your religion as a deficiency in the virtue of religion, superstition as an excess, and the types of your religion we talked about, particular injustices towards God, tempting God, simony, and sacrilege. And then these two specific examples that uh, question or deny God's existence, that's atheism and agnosticism. All right, so glad uh, you're here enjoying theological excellence in my basement with me. Uh, I've enjoyed it, and uh, I will see you tomorrow. New video by noon tomorrow. That will be Wednesday's lecture. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth.